what we have to remember is, is is when anybody's making a complex decision, they really want to make the right decision. They want to make the safe decision. And your job is to help people understand that you are the safe choice. Stop finishing presentations with a question, do you have any questions? Here's why. Is when you ask somebody, do you have any questions? What are you suggesting they should have? Because what they think is they're missing data because you told them they should be thinking they're missing data. Look how a simple swap in language changes everything. Hey, Masters, welcome to another episode of Path to Mastery. And today we are with Mr. Phil M. Jones. What's up, sir? Hey, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me back, David. It's good to be able to connect. I think it was last uh, two, three years ago, last time you and I spoke. I think it was uh, 2019. Yeah, it's been it's been a little while, man. A lot, lot has happened since then, huh? A huge amount. I mean, there's no point standing still, right? We're always building, we're always pushing, always looking to try and achieve more. Yeah. Amen. All kinds of crazy things has happened beyond just business, but I mean, just with with the world and, and COVID. It's a little different, right? So a little many. different, but we're not allowed to mention the P word in any form of our conversation today, right? How's that? Uh, the, okay. Got it. Is P word? What's the P word? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Well, let, let me tell y'all who, who's here. And, and we have Phil also streaming in the clubhouse. Uh, which I'm excited to do this. This We did this months ago, and then uh, I think it's something we're going to start doing a lot more of. But Phil is the author, uh, best-selling author of uh, of seven books, right? Um, as well as one children's book. Um, uh, it's called Children's Picture Book, and it was the most listened to nonfiction book of all time, audio book. Is that true? That's not my kid's book, but I am. Uh, I do ha- exactly what to say, in fact, is the most listened oh, to. Oh, okay. The one I'm holding book. in my hand. Yep. Okay. Okay. Awesome. And, and Phil uh, thinks and acts different, differently. His precise insights around communication um, added to a proven personal pedigree of peak performance and written, richness in a world where, uh, man, this is, this is terrible. My, my, my butchering <laughs> of bios is still in full effect, Phil. Um, of real world, real world experience means that Phil is the kind of thought leader whose counsel is sought by other thought leaders. Uh, Phil believes with passion that the answer to increased success in every area of life is to ask better questions, uh, focus on quality conversations as well as quantity, and that quite often the only the difference between you and others is knowing exactly what to say, when to say it, and how to make more of your conversations count, which is, uh, man, just so true. And at the age of 14, with nothing more than a sponge in a bucket, Phil went from a single from single-handedly washing cars on weekends to hiring a fleet of friends working on, on his behalf, resulting in him earning more than his teachers by the age of 15. Were, were you like me, Phil, when you when your teachers were like, you're just gonna be uh, you're, you're gonna be doing nothing? I mean, yeah, pretty much. I, I, I don't I think teach my teachers thought, thought much from my future career, actually, at yeah. the time. You're an entrepreneur, right? They don't, they don't understand entrepreneurship, you know? <laughs> um, early in his career, uh, early in his career was dynamic and challenging, including leading ex- experienced teams of sales professionals through his early 20s, as well as guiding Premier League football clubs to maximize sponsorships and licensing and agreement, agreements, in addition to helping grow an independent real estate brokerage to a revenue in excess of over $240 million with a sales team of five. Wow. That's awesome. That's so, why didn't I know you were a real estate guy? You know, I, I think I did know that and I just forgot. So, well, thanks for being here again, man. It's great to be here, man. It's good to be back. It's good to be back. I'm intrigued to see what we might chat about today. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about the book, exactly what to say, the, the one I'm holding up here. Right. And, and, you know, in, in the bio, and there's, there's so many things in here that just helped me on on the last conversation, I was running a a couple of Keller Williams offices and I was sharing with you how I was using some of the lines here in this book to, to set appointments, you know, and, uh, and it's just amazing, but I want to first talk about, you know, you, you, you say one of the things you think and act differently and, and, and you, you're, you're in, you know, your insights are around communication. So what, what makes you different? Like what, what's different about what you do than probably most salespeople do or the average people do? Um, 
I think in the world of sales, quite often what people focus the primary part of their effort and energy on is, is explaining their version of why they're better and explaining thousands of different reasons as to here are all the features, all the benefits you get to be able to work with me. And what quite often happens from that is the feeling on the buyer side of thing or the person who you're looking to be able to influence side of things is that it stinks of desperation. Like in the real estate world, the majority of listing appointments I've had the ability to be able to be on a fly on the wall for, it's like, please pick me, please pick me, please, 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 please pick me. And what happens is it lacks posture. And therefore, it puts you into second, third, fourth position just by its very nature. Now, the opposite side of that is arrogance, where somebody comes at this with so much of um, like a bullish approach that, yes, you win business, but what you're doing is you either love them or you hate them, right? Like there is no gray area in the middle. My approach is not hunting nor farming. My approach is more like fishing. Is, is how do you find exactly who it is that you want to do business with? How do you find where those people then hang out? And then what do you do to be able to present the right bait in front of those people to allow them to be able to come towards the thing that you're looking for, to be able to get them towards the next thing, to get them towards the next thing? So quite often what it means is that instead of being pushy, you become pulley. Mm. And the, you end up perhaps leading the dance of a complex conversation more so than uh, trying to sell your wares. And it, and it becomes conversational leadership more so than selling anything. So I think that, that that's quite often what people would share back with me as to how they describe that, that they see my work as being very different. Not only that, is I think in terms of like story math. And what do I mean by that is I mean that things always have to add up. And that means that quite often your route to getting somebody to say yes is best served if what you do is you destroy the option of no as opposed to embellish the option of yes. And if you approach a conversation by thinking, well, what is everything that anybody could ever say to me as a reason why they wouldn't want to move forward? How do I get them to not be able to say that thing? Then chances are we deduce the fact that yes is the right option, as opposed to entice them towards the fact that yes is the right option. I think the closest metaphor that you can get for understanding how I think on this is if you've ever seen the, the movie with Eminem, 8 Mile, and the, and the rap battle scene towards the end of the movie, where what Eminem is so fearful of is the other guy's going to dig up a load of his past in the rap battle and say bad things against him. What Eminem does is he puts that all out up front, leaving the other person lost for words. I think about selling persuasion and influence in a similar way to Eminem thinks about winning rap battles. Hmm. So, so in a sales situation, um, let's come, let's think of an example um, in real estate space. What, what would that look like in, in a real estate example? Well, think about it this way is, is what are you most fearful that somebody's going to say to you when you're in a listing appointment? Um, I don't know, me at this point, probably not much. Um, I, but let's, let's use a newer agent. Uh, you yep, know, you're yep. brand new in the business. So, so, so what are they fearful of? You know, agents as well as I know agents. Yeah, they're, they're not going to know what they're talking about. They're not going to know how to answer a question, right? Um, the person's going to find out they're brand new. They don't have experience, those things. Yeah. And they think that what's going to happen is somebody's going to question their experience and they're going to find themselves on the back foot like a little turtle on their back, arms paddling and waving, thinking I don't have an answer for this. So if you turn the back foot situation into a front foot situation and then you create a better question coming in, then um, you could ask a question early on in your listing appointment that might be something along the lines of, what is your experience of working with a professional real estate agent who has the ability to market properties in a modern way? Mm. Now, look, I've got two questions there, right? What I've done is I pre framed what is your experience of working with a professional real estate agent? Boom, right? What do I get back from that answer? Well, I've sold 13 houses in the past, like, da, 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 or, oh, this is my first time working with a real estate What else I've done, though, is I've seeded the comment who, who markets in a modern way or knows how to be able to market property in a modern way. What I've done is I've inserted curiosity into the conversation. Now, more often than not, the answer to that question is either I've sold multiple properties in the past with real estate agents, blah, 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 or this is my first, to which you could then grab control of the conversation and say something different. So what you could now do is when they said, I've worked with somebody in the past, you say, well, what three things did you like best about working with them? And listen, 
And you might then say, if there was one thing you could change about them, what would the one thing be? What am I doing is I'm collecting evidence. Oh, I love the fact they were responsive. I love the fact they knew the market. I love the fact that, that um, what they managed to be able to do was to help walk me through the transaction side of things. If there was one thing that uh, you know you wish they did differently, what would that be? Is, is I wish what they did is they just encouraged uh, me to be a bit bolder with the pricing when we took it to market in the first place. Because I still have this like, like thought in the back of my head that somebody might have paid more, particularly given the interest we had in this current market. Okay. And what am I doing when I'm getting context? What I can then say is, hey, would it help if I walked you through the reasons that our clients enjoy working with us as opposed to a traditional or a typical real estate agent? To which everybody on the planet is going to say, yes, what I've now got is I'm now taking the fact that I'm young and inexperienced and I'm playing as a strength. It allows me to be able to say is that the beauty of working with an organization like us is at any one period of time, we're only representing two, maybe three home sellers at any one period of time. And we have a really dynamic and a unique approach. So instead of you meeting somebody and then being farmed off their team, you work with me and my team for us to be able to build a robust, dynamic marketing platform for your unique property to help you get unique buyers to get you the best result. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you, you can play a problem as an asset if you don't wait for the thing to trip you up. What you can do is help people understand that what they really want is they want a young, inexperienced, hungry agent and help them realize that that's the best option for them if you're fearful of that's what they're going to say. So does that, does that example make sense to you? And what we got, we've got um, what is your experience with is the preface question. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, so what if, and, and I love what you said, and I like how it's being framed. So you're, you're almost creating a, you're creating a benefit, right, of, of the fact that, Maybe they don't have a lot of experience, but what if somebody does ask that question that all the new agents fear is, well, how many homes have you sold? Okay. And, and I'd say what, today? <laughs> today? Yeah. <laughs> Just, I don't know. None today. Right. <laughs> right. So that's what I would do is I'd break the ice with that and say, what, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. what, what today? Um, and then I'd say, well, how many homes do you want me to sell? I hope you're on listening on Clubhouse. This is good stuff. <laughs> right. How many homes do you want me to sell for you? Mm. And let's say just one, right? Just one, right? So we get to that. And then what I can do is I can own with honesty. Mm. Look, here's the deal. I was licensed as a real estate agent in April of this year, right? If that's your truth, tell them your truth. Prior to being a real estate agent, though, I ran a marketing agency or I was involved with one of the biggest brands on the planet or I was a qualified photographer or whatever you were, et cetera. And joining those two forces together, what we've established is that we can get more eyeballs on a property than anybody else. And here's the other thing to consider is because of the fact that you might well be the third property and the most expensive property I've ever sold, then you're going to get all of me. You're going to get my everything. And guess what? I want to sell this home more than you want to sell this home. And I don't think there's another agent locally that could say the same. I think they all want to sell it, but they also want to sell the other 17 people they're working with at this period of time. Whereas guess what? My success in this industry and making payroll for my family this week is dependent upon me doing a great job for you. So do you want somebody who's all in or somebody who's working on this for others? Because we all have the same tools on mass. But not anybody has the passion, enthusiasm, commitment, plus these other marketing assets that I have. I love it. So, so I, what you said is brilliant. Uh, and and uh, this is an important point too, Phil, is when they show up, they have to be prepared. Like they have to know what they're talking about. They better know the market, right? Sure. We can't, we can't That's table stakes. So we're assuming That's that, table stakes. Right? Yeah. I'm assuming that you've yeah. got knowledge of the market. I'm assuming that you're competent in being able to understand contracting and all the other things that are associated with being an agent. But more often than not, what we have to remember is, is, is when anybody's making a complex decision, they really want to make the right decision. They want to make the safe decision. And your job is to help people understand that you are the safe choice. Now, you can do that by having people feel smart, capable, and good. So they have to go away feeling that they are the smartest person on the planet choosing an inexperienced all-in agent 
the smartest person on the planet who is then capable because they chose you and they have to feel good about it and they feel good about it because they're like hey i'm giving this kid a chance i'm giving you know this this guy his first big break like they they have to feel good about it and now what happens is we insert the right energy into the work that's then going to follow on from here and it carries the momentum to the finish line awesome you said something earlier I want, to, I want to back up to. It says, uh, destroy the option of no. Right. What did you mean by that? Well, anything that anybody is going to throw you as a reason why they wouldn't want to, you can quite easily get them into a situation where they, you remove that objection from, them in, from their vocabulary. I'll tell you outside of the real estate world and just give you a quick story on this is I've spent chunks of my time helping some of the biggest brands on the planet increase conversion rates. Quite often or not, what they want me to do is to help their teams get better at overcoming objections. What I would rather do is do the work to make the objection impossible to be able to reach for in the first place. And I've shared this with businesses around the world and they're like, yeah, I don't understand what you mean. Just like what you're saying here right now, I don't understand what you mean. So what I say is like, instead of trying to put out the fire, I'm going to find the guy that was going to light the fire and I'm going to steal the matchbox from his pocket before he leaves the house, right? That's how you stop the fire from happening. They say, well, how does that work in the real world? I'll tell you how it works in the world of furniture. In the furniture industry, I've done a huge amount of work in, in changing conversion rates. And some of the biggest profit drivers in the world of furniture are um, fabric protection on couches and footstools, little upholstered ottomans that you can use to put your feet on. There's more margin in those two things than often there is in the rest of the transaction as a whole. The biggest reasons why people wouldn't have their fabric protected is they would give the objection, I do not eat and drink on my furniture. That was the most common objection people would give, mm. which I find fascinating because everybody I know eats or drinks on their furniture. Yeah. Yet still, people would Absolutely give a weird, dead, careful type question. And the biggest reason that people would tell us they didn't have a, want a footstool is because they haven't got the space. So I figured if what I could do is I could just prevent people from giving those two objections, conversion rate would go up. And I wrote what are called question trees. And I write question trees all the time to be able to prevent objections appearing. Here's the question tree I wrote. Apart from yourself, who will be using the furniture? Everybody on the planet would say, me, the wife, the kids. I'd follow it with a leading question saying what and a spot of entertaining. Every human being on the planet says yes to the and a spot of entertaining question because nobody admits to having no friends. Mm. So what I'd then do is follow up with another question. I'd say, is it going in your best room or your everyday room? Now, I don't mind which one picks that gateway question. I win either way, right? Best room needs to continually look its best. Every day room is going to take a hammering. I say your next piece of, uh, I say um, your last piece of furniture, how long did you keep that for? Now, it didn't matter whether they said three years, five years or 15 years. I say, I guess you're looking for this to last the same time or longer. Everybody on the planet says, yeah, sure. So they've told me they want it to last a long time. It's going in their best room or their everyday room, and they're often using it for entertaining. I'm in good shape to recommend a fabric protection, right? I'm in good shape, but I don't like good shape. I prefer a thing called certainty. Certainty is the thing I prefer. So I write one more question. The question I write is with a simple preface that you can use to get just about anybody to agree to just about anything. And the preface is the words, I bet you're a bit like me. If you use the preface of the words, I bet you're a bit like me, you can get reasonable people to agree to anything reasonable. So I'd say things like, I bet you're a bit like me, get home from work, enjoy nothing more than grabbing a beer and sitting down on the couch watching the sport. Yeah, that's me. I bet your household, much like mine, never finds time for a meal around the table as a family. More often than not, it's a tray on your lap in front of the box. Yeah, that's us. So they just mm. told me they eat and drink on their furniture. Still got this footstool to deal with. I'm scared they're not going to tell me they've got the space. So what do I do? I say, how big is this room of yours then, this best room? They tell me. Having never seen their room, obviously what I can't do is I can't tell them that they have space for a footstool. So I ask them the size of the room. They tell me the size of the room, whether they say three by nine or 15 by 52. I say, wow, that's a fair size room. How big is a fair size room? Well, a fair size room is a fair size. That label is going to serve me better than any other adjective I can use to be able to label the size of that room. I say, how are you going to lay out the furniture in the room? They try and tell me and I say, oh, can you draw it for me? put down a piece of paper in front of them. As they start to draw it, every human being on the planet other than architects creates me space in the diagram. What are they doing? They're putting tiny furniture, massive room. 
as they're doing the drawing, I'm asking questions like, well, what do you do when you're entertaining for extra chairs? They say, well, some people sat on the floor pulling chairs around from other room, all that kind of stuff. I said, what do you do for stories? They say, we've never got enough room for that. So am I now in good shape to be able to recommend a footstool? Heck yeah, I'm in good shape, but I don't like good shape. There's a thing I prefer, a thing called certainty. certainty. So I wrote one more question. Now, this question is a killer question. And it only relates really into the market that I was working this example into at the time. It was back into the UK. And the question I would ask is, um, Christmas time, where does the tree go? Now, why was that question powerful? Because I just found the home for the footstool for 11 months of the year. Mm. Here's what it allowed me to do. And what selling really is, is earning the right to make a recommendation catch that. I mean, earning the right to make a recommendation. What that means is you should never, ever, 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 ever invite anybody to do anything unless you can say these words first. And the words you should look to say first are the words because of the fact that you said. Because mm -hmm. of the fact that you said blank, blank, and blank, then for those reasons, what I'd recommend is blank, blank, and blank. So I could say, because of the fact that you said you want this to last a long time and it's going in your best room, and you're often entertaining. For those reasons, I'd recommend you have your fabric professionally sealed at the factory. Makes a lot of sense, right? Now, because of the fact that you said you're often struggling for extra chairs, what most people go for is that they have a footstool. You can use it as an extra chair. It also helped with that storage issue you mentioned. And if you're ever wondering where it fits, it sits underneath your feet. Try and tell me you've not got space. That's the best way I can explain to you today, David, what I mean by destroying the option of no. Is you know all the reasons why somebody might say no or maybe. If I ask realtors to say, what are all the excuses that buyers and sellers give back to you? You can rattle that list off easy. But you could also do the work to ask smarter questions mm -hmm. to allow people to either turn that into a real reason that you can learn from, i.e. they don't have the money and get the truth from them or stop them using the stupid excuses they're using right now to stop you moving forward. So let me ask you, so what you just did was, was, uh, was awesome. You know, and I'm, I'm guessing it takes a, a good amount of, um, you got to invest, right? You got to invest the time practice to do that. So how, how would somebody listening to this, like, let's say you want to go and say, okay, here's, because I know there's probably eight objections I get in real estate if I'm going to meet with somebody or if somebody's going to list my house. So I can, I know that what's, what's going to be said ahead of time. So how much time should somebody listening to this be investing and in? what should they be doing to get really good at what you just did? Like what, what's the process for that? Um, how much time is an impossible thing to answer, right? I believe that we should all be on the relentless quest for better. You're here talking about the path to mastery. The path to mastery is a road that is well-traveled with no finish line, right? Like, like, like anybody who's any good at anything is still working on getting better. So I don't think it's like how much time. Well, let, think, let me say it before you answer. The reason I say it, because I think sometimes we have to at least commit to a certain amount of time, right? I, Otherwise, I, I, right? Like, like this so, isn't something like you can just read in a book and then go put it into practice. You need mm -hmm. the reps. You need the scars, you also need to have actually then got the reps of doing it wrong, the reps of doing it slightly better, the aha moment that comes from what the heck was I messing about with the last 97 times? This way is just easier. Then you need the refinement that then comes on the fact that you found a process that works better. Then you need the emotional intelligence of being able to truly understand the person you're looking to be able to influence. So what you can do is that you can completely rewrite the script and the question again. Then what you need to be able to do is to read market conditions. Then what you need to be able to do is to read what's happening with the person in front of you at the same time. And this is why pros win and other people show up and disappear. This is why in the world of real estate, there are some people that just keep building on success over a period of time. And the majority disappear after their third transaction because it was just too hard. They kept coming second and third and second and third, and they didn't know why. So the work is understanding that your decision, is, that, that, that their decision is multifaceted. It's, do I choose you or someone like you? Do I choose now or do I choose later? If I do choose you, at what price do I choose you? And what people are looking for is reasons to not choose somebody. They're not looking for reasons to choose somebody. And what happens when you shoot with questions as opposed to statements, you rarely lose.
because you can always ask another question. Whereas if you just shoot with statements or you send people your value prop or you share with them your list of bullets of everything that's in your menu of services, it's too easy for them to say, whoop, there's a reason to not pick that person. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of time, yeah, until it sticks, until it's second nature, there's a reason that exactly what to say, I believe, is the most listened to nonfiction book on the whole of Audible is because a lot of smart people know that repetition is one of the great ways of being able to absorb new information. It's an hour and 15 minute long audio book. I know dozens of people that listen to it weekly yeah. just as a wash, but it isn't just listen to the work. It's then apply it. Also, if you want to get good at this stuff, then start mastering the skills in low stake environments. Why can't you get better at asking questions of your loved ones to help make smarter decisions in your home life? Why can't you get better at asking questions of the, um, the restaurant host to better, better understand the menu choice you're about to make? Like, why can't you do a better conversation with your friend group to be able to influence where you choose to be able to go and watch the ball game? Like, these are all environments where you get to be able to play and master the craft. You don't have to wait to your next uh, buyer console or listing appointment before you can be able to get to mastery. But David, here's, here's where mastery really kicks in. It, it's in your debrief. And we have fragile egos in this world. And what we want to do is we want to come away from every conversation being like, dang, I was awesome. And then if they don't pick you, you're like idiots, right? Like that's how you often feel sometimes. Whereas there needs to be a little humble switch inside your own persona that says, I'm here for growth. And what I want all of you to think about is how do you debrief critical conversations better? And the way you can do this is by asking yourself or by producing two simple lists following every critical conversation. And here are the lists. See, most people would focus on what did I do right or what did I do wrong? And they'd encapsulate this in a period of time. I'd want you to do two different lists. First list is a list of LBs. LB stands for like best. What do you like best about how that presentation went? What did you like best about how that call went? What do you like best about how that open house went? What do you like best about how that showing went? And write your list of like bests. I like that I look great. I like that I arrived on time. I like that I asked great questions. I like that I had all my prep done. I like that I knew my numbers. I like that I picked comparable comps. I like that I'd done the work to say that who are the people that I know that they know. I liked, I liked, I liked, I liked. Only once you've finished your like best list and only once you've truly exhausted it, do you jump to the next list? And the next list is your NTs. And NT stands for next time. What would I do differently next time? Hmm. Well, next time I, I might not wobble when they ask me if I will reduce my fee. Next time I, um, I might just do a little bit more research about other comparables that happen in their area. Next time, I might just get them to share some more story about where they're going next and why it's important for them to move right now. Next time, what I might do is I might just get more insight about their experience of working with professional realtors across the board. Next time I might, right? And what we do when you do LBs and next times is when, when you've done your like bests, you're cementing all your positive behaviors. You're turning them into habits. You're saying, that's what I always do. You're not forgetting to be brilliant at the basics. And next time puts you on this journey of continuous growth. Says, I'm going to keep getting better, as opposed to trying to label things like there were a moment in time. What we do say is it's all water. And all we're looking to be able to do is to keep moving in a slightly better way. And this LBs and NTs focus puts you on this relentless quest for better more so than trying to provide judgment to a historic set of events. Uh, yeah. Amazing. I want to, I'm going to jump to the book. Um, I'm also going to see if, uh, if we have any uh, in a minute, any questions from the, the people on clubhouse. Um, there was one of my, one of my favorite lines from the book and I have it all highlighted out and yeah. is uh, I'm not sure if this is for you. And but. that, that shift had, when I, when I was calling, uh, real estate agents. I remember that that had made such a difference when I would start the conversation with, "Hey, I'm not sure if this is for you," um, or, uh, "But I'm not sure if this is for you." But would you happen to know someone who's interested in doubling or tripling their real estate business? 
Right. Uh, and and um, that that got people from saying, no, I'm not interested to being having an open conversation, open minded conversation with you. Like, well, what do you mean? Right. Right. So that's just one of I mean, I, I, I one of dozens of just amazing tips in this book exactly what to say that I need, everybody needs to go get a copy. Is there, is there like, do you have like a favorite that you want to share though, from the book? Like what, have, what's your I go-to? Have, I mean, they're all there with purpose. And what's interesting with every example in the book is really the example is teaching a principle. See, most books try and teach you the principle so you can create the example. What I do in my books is I teach you the example. So you understand the principle. Mm. See, the principle you just talked about with the sequence of words, I'm not sure if it's for you, but is that if you position an idea to somebody, not directly at them, but to the left or to the right, them put it in the gray space, people are more likely to move towards it. If you position an idea straight at someone, they're like, you don't know me. And friction is created. The happy space for negotiation is in the gray space. The minute you show up with certainty, you create uncertainty. If you show up with uncertainty, you can get to certainty. If we're talking examples, though, is I'd love to share with you the, um, I don't know if you know we did this. I did exactly what to say for real estate. Yes. So we blew this thing up and talked it directly just towards the real estate marketplace. And I'm going to pull just one thing from this that I think will be ridiculously useful for everybody listening here right now, and particularly in a listing appointment. And anybody listening to this on repeat, have you ever had somebody say the words to you, I just need some time to think about it? All the time. Happens as a common objection. Here's another thing I want you to check in with yourself on. Have you ever finished a listing presentation with the question, do you have any questions? I'm guessing lots of people have done that too. Mm. Here are a couple of things to think about. Is firstly, you are highly likely the cause of the I need some time to think about it objection. You created that whole thing. And David, play with me on this a second. Is the advice I want to bring to the finishing a presentation with a question, do you have any questions, is really quite clean. And if you have pen and paper in front of you at home right now, you want to write this advice down, is um, stop it. Just stop it. Stop finishing presentations with the question, do you have any questions? Here's why. Is when you ask somebody, do you have any questions? What are you suggesting they should have? Questions. And if you've done your job right, what are you hoping they don't have? Questions. <laughs> That's a good but you point. just told them that they should have. Yeah. Yet you did such a good job that they don't, but they're now feeling like they should have. So what they're all thinking is I must be missing information. I'm missing data. What am I missing? What am I missing? What am I missing? For fear of appearing stupid. They say things like, I need some time to think about it. Can you send me an email? Have you got a brochure? Can you put the paperwork together? They stall because what they think is they're missing data because you told them they should be thinking they're missing data. Look how a simple swap in language changes everything. Instead of saying, do you have any questions? Swap the language to what questions do you have for me? Hmm. Now what happens? If you finish a listing presentation and say, what questions do you have for me? What does almost every agent on the planet, uh, every um, home seller on the planet say back? Yeah, I don't have any questions. No questions, right? Which means they've just admitting to having all the information they need to make a decision, which means they've already made a decision. Mm. Which means you now both know that, which means you don't have to ask for the decision. You just have to lead the dance towards the next step. And the magic words to lead the dance towards the next step are just the word. So the next step is. So the next step is that what we're going to need to do is to get some exquisite photography done of your property. And we need to schedule that in. And is that something we can do in the week? Um, or is that something you'd rather do at the weekend? Right. We can lead the dance by painting out what normal looks like and what's from here. But instead, we're like, do you have any questions? And they say, well, oh, you know, I just need some time to think about it. And we say, it's OK, I'll leave it with you. We're ready when you're ready. And we leave with our fingers crossed. And then we I'm just checking in, yeah. just following up. Fantastic. Just seeing how you're doing. And um, people don't want to see that weakness in you winning the listing business in the person they want to represent them in negotiating one of the biggest transactions in their life. And if you lead the dance at the listing appointment, 
they'll see how strong what you'll do is you'll lead the follow-up process on everybody who shows interest, every internet lead that comes through, every uh, potential agent conversation about where you're at with regards to price. They won't roll over there. They'll lead the dance again. And, and that very tiny action will make a phenomenal difference to conversion rates within listing appointments. 100%. Fantastic. All right. Let me see um, if we have, do we have any questions from our friends on Clubhouse? We probably got time for maybe one or two questions. Anybody uh, give me a mic flash if you want to ask Phil a question. Phil, it looks like, uh, oh, actually Peggy. Hey, what's up, Peggy? How are you? Hey, I don't have a question per se, but I just like that really important point of, of re- Changing. Phil, do you hear Peggy? I hear her, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, my, my point that I wanted to break, bring up that I like was rewording the question. Let me know if you have any questions versus what questions do you have for it's me? Really I think good. that definitely says a lot more. I'm definitely going to take that away from today. Really, really good. Yeah, amazing. Um, okay, any anybody else before... Uh... Well, you guys are all quiet today. I, I brought you up here because... David, I do. Okay, excellent. Hi, Phil. Um, this is Chiragi. I'm a new agent and new to the industry. Um, so I'm so glad I got on this call because this was very informative. And do you have any suggestion? I already bought the book just now, um, exactly what to say, because I think that especially for me, I know I'm going to, I definitely need that because I'm always struggling with asking the right question and struggling with what to say next. So I'm hoping that this will really help me. But do you also have any suggestion for any book um, that I should read, um, like besides this one, you know, that will help me when I'm with my clients? I'm an avid reader, read a lot of books. I'm going to ask you one question first is if there's one thing that you think you needed more of in your life right now, what would that one thing be? And then I'll make a book recommendation based on that answer. Well, to improve myself uh, when I'm talking, um, that's what I really need. Like I really need to be able to communicate better. Okay. So I think... I would encourage you to get both the versions of exactly what to say so that you have the real estate version too. But I think there is something that I would encourage you to lean into right now that might even be more helpful. And it's a brand new book by a lady called Kendra Hall, K-I-N-D-R-A-H-A-L-L, -L -L, Kendra Hall. And mm -hmm. she just wrote a new book on, uh, on storytelling that is more about the stories that you tell yourself and the impact that those stories have on your own personal performance. And that book, I think, might unlock more of your confidence to come into conversations and allow you to show up to those conversations with more of your true self and help silence some of that inner voice that is currently perhaps slowing you down or giving you, you know, some negative chatter that is is potentially affecting your competent your confidence and then in turn your competence so i'd come at it both sides i'd use my book for skills and i'd, I'd lean yes. into kindra's book for mindset mm. so is that the storytelling is that what it's called kindra Hall? Um, let me just find the exact title for it on amazon um i have it in my other office i only read it recently i thought it was great and and the one you the one you said that I have to buy both version like so the one I bought just now is called exactly what to say the magic words yeah that's the only one you're talking about right I would say and, and then, and if you want specifics for real estate buy exactly what to say for real estate um, oh, okay yeah I did okay. see that one too and and the book of Kendra's is called choose your story change your life mm, I heard of that that's a good book yeah it's only like two and a half weeks old as well. And it's crushing it. I think it will be one of the big hits of this coming year. All right. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Chir Chir Chiraji. Thank you for the question. Hope I said your name uh, close to right. Yeah, you did. All right. Awesome. Thank thank, thanks for popping in. I gave you a follow back as well. So thanks for uh, popping into the space. Um, Phil, how, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, do it. One more. Okay. Do we have uh, one more? I see Bobby flashing. Yeah. yeah. Hey. What's up, hey, Bobby? David. Uh, hey, Hey, how you doing? Uh, hey, Phil, love the conversation. Uh, 
Just curious uh, in your work, what are, what are the most common mistakes you see real estate agents uh, making uh, to get to, uh, you know, getting commitment? There's so many. If, if there is one right now that I keep seeing on repeat, it's real estate agents being too short-sighted in where business could come from. And there's a lot being done to drive new leads through Facebook or through Instagram marketing or people, you know, adding contact details to forms, et cetera. Um, and then these leads are being trashed real fast. If somebody isn't ready to buy, they don't meet buying criteria quickly. Um, there's just this assumption that we want to deal with all the transactional stuff. Mm. And just about every human being on the planet is either going to need a real estate agent in some way, or they're going to know somebody that needs a real estate agent in some way. And my belief is those that lean into relationships, those that take the role to educate the market as opposed to just deal with those that are three yards from the touchline are the ones that will win in the next decade. And the mistake that I see on repeat is because markets are so buoyant and they're so challenged right now because of lack of inventory and everything else, you know, people want all the easy ones. Now, when the market turns again and inventory comes back and what happens is there becomes more choice Everybody who was transactional and rapid in the way that they interacted with humans will be forgotten. And the ones that actually showed up and, and helped people in the tough time, even though they didn't transact, will be the ones that really shine. And I think there's a giant chance on that just to slow down conversations with prospective buyers and sellers to be able to help them realize that now might not be the right time for them to move, but you are the right agent to help them move when the time is right. Mm, great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby, for the question. Um, and appreciate every one of you on Clubhouse. Uh, thank you, Phil. I know we, we had scheduled about 35 minutes or so a bit over. Appreciate you doing this. Um, what's the best way? And, and by, before you give that, tell us, uh, I, I would recommend everybody get your audio book as well. Yeah. I would get both. I personally have both. I love, I love listening to audio book and I read it at the same time because the audio book's really, really good. That's actually how I was turned on to you three years ago, somebody recommended the audio book and it was fantastic. Thank um, you, so man. what's the uh, best way for, for everybody listening to this as well as the people right now on Clubhouse to get in touch with you? I mean, you can find out just about everything about me on the website, which is philmjones.com. If you want to continue the conversation in some way, and I'll, I'll stick it up here on the video, is Instagram is at philmjonesuk. Come follow, come leave comments, come hit up the DMs if you've got questions that I can help with. Uh, that's where you're going to get the most conversational and responsive version of me online um, in windows of my travel schedule, et cetera. I'm often chatting, coaching, guiding, helping people along on their sales journey um, via my Instagram DM. So come say hi there and be happy to have some new followers and happy to meet some new friends. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you as always, my friend. And a final question is with regards to, you know, what we talked about today. What we, what's the what's the thing you want everybody to walk away with that that listen to this interview today? If there's one thing that needs to be, you know, implemented or walked away with, what 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 is that? The worst time to think about the thing you're going to say is in the moment when you're saying it. Mm. So what is that? What is that plan? We're planning. We're planning. Well, think on that statement for a second is how many times do you come away from an important conversation thinking shoulda, woulda, coulda mm -hmm. thinking here's what I could have done differently after the fact. If you put that in ahead of time, you think about the questions you're going to ask. You think about the things that other people are going to say. You put yourself into a position where you're confident with your competence in those critical conversations. You can show up more present. You get more out of every conversation. You stop just counting conversations. You make those conversations count. So, so I think it is that work before the work that is probably the most essential part of this. And, and I can teach people tricks all day long, but if you don't put the effort into actually being able to find mastery before you're in the moment, the moment passes and you didn't get to execute. It's all worthless. Yeah, man. Got to put in the work. There's, there's, no, uh, there's no shortcuts around it. There's, there's no way not to. So exactly. uh, awesome. So everybody put in the work. Uh, thank you for listening and make sure you connect right away. Go to Phil, uh, jump on his Instagram, follow him. It's Phil M. Jones UK. That's right. All right. Awesome. Appreciate you, Phil. Thanks for being here today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.